Hello, I am Dr. Ng Sui Ching. Welcome to this short video on systemic vasculitis. In the next 15 minutes, you will learn what is systemic vasculitis, how to classify the different types of systemic vasculitides, the epidemiology, pathophysiology, clinical features, and management of the important vasculitides, when to suspect that a patient has vasculitis, and finally, investigations for vasculitis. What is systemic vasculitis? As the name suggests, vasculitis is a disease where there is inflammation of the blood vessels. When damaged, the blood vessels may either perforate and bleed into the adjacent tissue or thrombose resulting in ischemia or infarction of dependent tissue. And the clinical manifestations will depend on the size and distribution of the damaged vessel. How do we classify the different types of systemic vasculitides? We can classify them by the size of the vessel involved and by the associated disease. When we classify vasculitides by size, they can be either large, medium, small, or variable vessel disease. In the large vessel disease, the vasculitis affects the aorta and its major branches. The medium-sized vessels affect the main visceral arteries in the abdomen, the kidneys, and the branches. The small vessel vasculitis affects the small intraparenchymal vessels and the variable vessel vasculitis can affect vessels of any size and type, and this include the condition known as Bechet's. When we classify vasculitides by the associated disease, there can be a category where vasculitis is associated with a systemic disease like SLE or rheumatoid arthritis. The vasculitis can also be associated with a probable etiology, like a viral infection as in hepatitis B, or due to drugs as in cocaine. And finally, there's a group where there are no associated disease causing the vasculitis, and these are the single organ vasculitis, like the central nervous system vasculitis. I will now discuss in more details the important systemic vasculitides. These are the large vessel vasculitis, that's Dakayasu arteritis and the giant cell arteritis, the medium vessel vasculitis, including polyarthritis nodosa and Kawasaki's, and the small vessel vasculitis, which are the anchor associated and the immune complex vasculitis. The large vessel vasculitis are the Takayasu arteritis and the giant cell arteritis. They both affect the large vessels, but clinically they are two distinct conditions. Takayasu arteritis tend to affect the aorta and its branches, and there is granulomatous inflammation. The condition tends to affect young adults, usually under 40 years of age, of Asian descent and mostly women. It is a rare condition, with only 1 to 2 new cases per million in Western countries, but about 150 new cases are seen per year in Japan. Giant cell arteritis also affects the large vessels, but they affect the external carotid and the branches, including the temporal artery. There are giant cells with granuloma formation. The condition tends to affect older adults, usually over age 50, and of European descent, not Asian. There are slightly more females, and the condition is a bit more common than Takayasu's, and the lifetime risk of giant cell arteritis is about 1% in women and 0.5% in male in Western countries. Patients with Takayasu suffer systemic symptoms early in the disease and develop hypertension or ischemic symptoms like arm claudication. 
Treatment in the early stage would include steroids and immunosuppressants like azathioprine or mycophenolate. In late cases, revascularization surgery may be needed. Giant cell arthritis, on the other hand, presents with headaches, jaw claudication, and visual problems. 40 to 50% of these patients also suffer from polymyalgia rheumatica where they have aches and pains. And unlike Takayasu, which is a chronic condition, giant cell arthritis is self-limiting. It is treated with steroids and maybe methotrexate, and revascularization is rarely needed. This x-ray shows a patient with Takayasu's with heavily calcified aorta and segments of dilatation and narrowing of the descending aorta. This scan of the same patient shows the marked calcification of the aorta with segments of dilatation and narrowing. The medium vessel vasculitis that we will discuss are polyarthritis nodosa or PAN and Kawasaki's disease. PAN is a systemic necrotizing vasculitis affecting medium-sized muscular arteries. The condition affects older adults about age 60 with a slight male predominance. It is a rare condition with a prevalence of about 2 to 33 per million. Kawasaki's disease is a systemic vasculitis which also affects medium-sized arteries but especially the coronaries. The innate immune system probably plays a role. There are no autoantibodies in this condition. The disease tends to affect East Asian children with up to 90% of patients under the age of 5. There is a slight male predominance. Patients with PAN present with fever, palpable purpura, pneumopathy, abdominal pain, and hypertension. The kidneys, gastrointestinal tract, together with skin, joints, and muscles may be involved. The condition is chronic and is treated with steroids, azathioprine, methotrexate, or cyclophosphamide. If hepatitis B is also present, the patient will require specific antiviral therapy. Children with Kawasaki's, on the other hand, present with fever and a mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. Their feared complication is the giant coronary artery syndrome. The acute illness is short and should be treated with aspirin and IVIG. However, there may be long-term cardiac complication when the child grows up. This angiogram shows the aneurysm in the abdominal arteries. They are circled in red. There are many types of small vessel vasculitis and we will group them into two categories. These are the anchor-associated vasculitis, which do not have immune complex, and the group of vasculitis with immune complex. Under the anchor-associated vasculitis, there are three different conditions. They are the neutrophil predominant granulomatous disease or GPA, previously called Wagoners, the eosinophilic predominant granulomatous disease, eGPA, previously called Chirk Strauss, and finally, those with no granulomatous disease called the microscopic polyangiitis or MPA. As the name suggests, these conditions are associated with autoantibodies, ANCA, which is the anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. The other category of small vessel vasculitis are those with immune complexes. They are immunoglobulin A vasculitis, cryoglobulinemic vasculitis, hypocomplementemic urticarial vasculitis, and the antiglomerular basement membrane disease. The anchor-associated vasculitis are important conditions. 
and all of them affect the small and sometimes the medium-sized vessels. And as their name suggests, the histology is different. In the GPA, there is necrotizing vasculitis with granulomas and polymorphs. In the eGPA, there is also necrotizing vasculitis with granulomas but with eosinophils. And in MPA, there is no granuloma, only necrotizing vasculitis with glomerular nephritis and pulmonary hemorrhage. All three conditions tend to affect older adults in their 50s and 60s with an almost equal male-to-female ratio. They are uncommon condition, with eGPA occurring in only about 14 per million people and GPA occurring in about 160 per million. As for presentation, patients with GPA presents with vague symptoms of fever, malaise, and weight loss. They can have specific features in the upper and lower respiratory tract with ENT symptoms and lung nodules or cavities. In addition, the kidney may also be involved as part of the typical pulmonary renal syndrome. EGPA is a unique condition and occurs in three phases. In the prodrome, there is bronchial asthma for many years. Then, the patient develops a high eosinophil count. And finally, the disease goes into a vasculitic phase with ENT or renal involvement. MPA may present like GPA, with vague ill health and lung hemorrhage or nephritis or skin vasculitis. In all three conditions, anchor is often positive. Anchor is seen in about 90% of patients with GPA, and these are the C anchors again, the antigen PR3. Anchor is positive in 70% of patients with MPA, but these are the P anchors or antibodies against the antigen MPO. Anchor is positive in only about 50% of patients with eGPA. The management of anchor associated vasculitis is similar for all three conditions. Treatment is given according to the severity of the disease. For severe disease, there is induction therapy followed by maintenance therapy, where less aggressive medication is used. Patients with mild disease are simply treated with steroids with a steroid-sparing agent like methotrexate. But patients with moderate to severe disease may require high dose of steroids with cyclophosphamide and rituximab. This patient with anchor positive vasculitis has cutaneous vasculitis on her feet as well as at the elbow. This is another patient with anchor-associated vasculitis, but he has the serious complication of pulmonary hemorrhage as seen in the ground glass appearance on this CAT scan. So when would we suspect that a patient has systemic vasculitis? We should suspect the condition when he presents with one of the following features. Constitutional symptoms of feeling unwell with fever and weight loss. When the patient has multiple organ disease, example pulmonary syndrome, then we will suspect GPA. When we see organ ischemia, like orchitis, when we suspect PAN. Or we see hypertension in a young person, when we will suspect Takayasu. This is a more detailed list of signs and symptoms seen in patients with the various vasculitides. Patients with large vessel vasculitis may have bruise, absent pulse, asymmetric BP, or jaw claudication. Patients with medium vessel vasculitis may have nodules, livido reticularis, digital gangrene, or mononeuritis multiplex. Patients with small vessel vasculitis may have palpable purpura, urticaria, eye involvement like scleritis or glomerular nephritis or even pulmonary hemorrhage. 
These are the investigations that we should do when we suspect vasculitis. They include general tests for inflammation like ESR, CRP, full blood count, tests for organ involvement like urine, liver function tests, chest x-ray, tests suggesting anchor vasculitis like C anchor or P anchor or NTPR3 or NTMPO, or tests suggesting immune complex vasculitis like rheumatoid factor and ANA. We can also do tests looking for an etiology, like patients with PAN, we should look for hepatitis B or hepatitis C infection, cryoglobulin, parvovirus, or HIV. We can also do a myeloma screen. To confirm the diagnosis, you can either biopsy the vessel or do an angiogram. The positron emission tomography is also a useful way to look for inflamed vessels that we cannot biopsy. In the past 15 minutes, you have learned what is systemic vasculitis. You have also learned how to classify the different types of systemic vasculitis according to the vessel size or the etiology. You have learned about the epidemiology, pathophysiology and the clinical features and management of the important vasculitis, namely the large vessel vasculitis like Takayasu's and giant cell arthritis, the medium-sized vasculitis like the polyarthritis nodosa and Kawasaki's disease and the small vessel vasculitis, the anchor vasculitis and vasculitis associated with the immune complex. Then, you have learnt about the various signs and symptoms that will make you suspect that a patient has vasculitis. And finally, the investigations that should be done when you suspect that a patient has vasculitis. I hope that this video has been useful. Thank you for your attention.